Uh, hello, welcome to lecture six uh, in the spring 2020 offering of the graduate course ECE 252E. Uh, this lecture deals with chapter eight in the textbook, which is the last of four chapters on the topic of addition. It deals with adding uh, several numbers rather than just two numbers. And the chapter serves as a good transition into the topic of multiplication, which comes in the next part of the textbook. Because multiplication is a prime application of these multi-operant addition techniques that we discuss in this chapter. So they're used primarily, although not exclusively, in designing multipliers. So basically, the highlights of this chapter are the following concepts. Uh, as we add numbers, we keep the running total in redundant form. And by doing so, uh, when we add the current total to the next number to find the new total, there is no carry propagation. So this operation of adding numbers to a running total is extremely fast. There's no carry propagation. And then at the very end, once we have added all the numbers, we let the carries propagate instead of storing them to find the uh, final sum, the total of all numbers in conventional binary or decimal representation. Okay, we also will see the concepts of Wallace and data trees. These are two techniques for adding uh, multiple numbers that are used in designing multipliers. And we'll also become familiar with the concepts of parallel counters and at the very end, modular multi-operand addition. Okay. So let's begin by looking at two uh, examples of where multi-operand addition is encountered. Uh, the left example is uh, multiplication. Uh, the four-bit numbers A and X are being multiplied. And for each bit of x, we form a partial product, which is the product of that bit of x and the number a. And those are shifted with respect to each other because different bits of x have different weights. And then uh, once these partial products have been generated, they have to be uh, added together. And that's where multi-operand addition comes into place. So those four partial products must be added to get the final product. Okay, so the techniques that we'll see in this chapter help us do this multi-operand addition uh, quickly and efficiently. Uh, on the right, you see an example of uh, inner product of two vectors. So let's say we have two uh, vectors. Uh, this is a toy example. Each each element of the, each vector is a three-bit number. When we multiply two elements, say element x0 of vector x and element y0 of vector y, we get a six-bit number. So that's p0. Then we get P1 by multiplying X1 by Y1, another six-bit number, and so on. And then we have to add these product terms to find the inner product. So this is, again, a multi-operand addition problem. After we have done all the multiplications, we are faced with multi-operand addition. Uh, the only difference between these two, the example on the right and the example on the left, is that the numbers that are being added 
are aligned on the right side in the inner product example, but they are shifted with respect to each other in the multiplication example. But that doesn't complicate the process. You know, they're, they're both really the same thing because in those shifted uh, versions of the numbers to be added, all the blanks that you see there are, can be replaced with zeros, and therefore the, the two problems become really equivalent. Okay, of course, when you want to add multiple numbers, the easiest way is just use a two operand adder that we have seen how to design and use that two operand adder repeatedly each time feeding it with a new number from the list of numbers to be added. And the running total is kept in that partial sum register. So the contents of that partial sum register is added to a new number. And the result is stored. And this process is repeated n times if we are adding n numbers. So we are taking n k-bit numbers, and we are adding them. And therefore, we require n cycles of using this adder in order to add. So the partial sum register is initialized to 0. In cycle 1, uh, or cycle 0, if you want to call it, x0 comes in. In cycle 1, x1 comes in, and so on. And by the time the nth input has come in, and we have added that to the running total, we have the total of all the n numbers. Now, if each of the numbers is k bits wide, and we want to find the true sum of the n k bit numbers, the register should be log 2 n bits wider. Because as we add more and more numbers, the width of the partial sum grows. And you need log 2 n bit more bits in that partial sum register. On the other hand, if we know that the sum of all the numbers is representable as a k bit number, so we are not worried about overflow, then we can make that partial sum register k bits wide. Either way, you know, the method is the same. It requires n clock cycles, where a clock cycle should be wide enough to accommodate the latency of the adder and also the time needed to store the output of the adder in the partial sum register. So this is basically using a two operand adder over n cycles to add the n numbers. So uh, in way of analysis, the time for this method will be order n, because we need n cycles. And each cycle could be long enough, should be long enough to uh, sort of allow that adder to operate. And that adder, uh, the longer of the two input operands to the adder, is k plus log n bit wide. And if the adder is logarithmic time adder, like a carry look ahead adder, uh, or conditional sum adder, it's a logarithmic time adder, log of k plus log n is the latency of the adder. So the total delay is order n times log of k plus log n, the first equation on this slide, this one. And then we can sort of multiply out and say this is order n log k plus n log log n. So which of these two terms dominates depends on the relationship between n and k. So if n is very large, it may be that log log n dominates log k. So this will be the complexity. On the other hand, uh, in other cases, when log k dominates log log n, then the complexity will be order n. Time complexity would be order n log k.
Okay, so we see here that if k is a constant, if we are dealing with constant with numbers, then log k is a constant. So this first term will be order n. So the second term will dominate. So the complexity is super linear with n, grows more than linearly with n. And if k, uh, for a given n, if, if you fix n, a particular value of n, then the time complexity grows as log k. Okay, so now can we do things faster? Can we do it in either fewer than n cycles or in n cycles but use cycles that require much less time than what you see here in this first expression? A log uh, log k plus log n is basically the length of each cycle. That's the latency of the adder. Can we do better either by reducing the number of cycles or by making each cycle faster? Now this is basically using a pipeline adder. Now you may think that we can make that adder pipeline so that we can feed data into it faster. So let's say if this adder is a four-stage pipeline, then the clock cycle can be reduced by a factor of about four. However, this design doesn't work with a pipeline adder. The reason for that being that once you add the first number to the running total, before that value goes and sits into this register, it takes four cycles. But by then, we are inputting more values. And those values are added not to that correct sum, but to a stale value that happens to be in this register. So we can directly replace this adder with a pipeline adder and expect to be able to do this operation faster. One solution is this. So here I'm using four stage pipeline adders, three of them, to do this computation four times faster. Because these are four stage pipeline adders, I can feed input into them four times as fast. However, the latency for the first input to emerge at the output is 12 clock cycles, okay? Four clock cycles through this adder, four through this adder, and four. So the first value will emerge at the right after 12 clock cycles. However, a new value will come out, a new partial sum will come out each clock cycle after that. So if you have a large number n of inputs, like say, let's say 1,000, those 12 initial stages basically can be ignored. And we have roughly 1,000 cycles of these short duration required for one stage of this pipeline to add the numbers. So we have a factor of 4 speed up using a factor of 3 more hardware. So those of you who have taken parallel processing will say, well, this is imp impossible, right? Because in parallel processing, we saw that if you use P processors, then the maximum speed up you can hope for is P. This uh, scheme seems to violate that principle. We are using three times as much hardware, ignoring these delay elements here, assuming that their complexity is low compared to the others. So we are using three times as much hardware, but achieving a fourfold speed. Up. So this is a challenging problem for you to think about, see why this is not a violation uh, of the principle that we studied in parallel processing. Now to understand the operation of this pipeline implementation, you see that when xi 
is being input at the left, the height input Let me recover my pointer. Okay. When xi is being input, xi minus 1, the previous input is here because it's delayed by one unit. So xi minus 1 and xi will be added. And after four clock cycles, the sum of the two will emerge here. Therefore, at the current moment, we have the sum of xi minus 4 and xi minus 5 sitting here, four cycles ago. And then we have the sum of xi minus 6 and xi minus 7 sitting here because there's two cycle delay. And then when you add these two values, the sum of xi minus 4, xi minus 5, xi minus 6, xi minus 7 will go here. But because we are looking four cycles before, this will be xi minus 8, my, my i minus 9, i minus 10, i minus 11. And then the value sitting here is the sum of all values up to i minus 12. So when you add that, the sum of all values up to i minus 12, you add i minus 11, i minus 10, i minus 9, i minus 8, in four cycles, you get the sum of all values up to i minus 8. Okay? So I leave it up to you to look into this design and convince yourself that it works correctly so that the partial sum up to j always appears at the output, in particular at the very end of the process when the end input comes in, when the end input comes in, we have to wait 12 cycles before the pipeline is flushed and the sum of all values up to the end value appears here. Okay, so this is a little bit faster, but not fundamentally faster. It's still order n. Okay, order n times whatever latency each of these stages has. Now, each of these stages is faster than the entire adder, but it's only a factor of 4 faster, so it's still um, order log k. Okay, so this is some improvement. We can get a major improvement if we do the additions in parallel using multiple adders. So here I've shown the addition of seven k-bit numbers using a tree of adders so that the inputs are added pairwise, pairwise at the first level. And this, this because the number of inputs is odd, this one is not added to anything. It's forwarded to the second level. Then we add numbers in the second level to get these two numbers, and then add those in the third level to get the sum. The number of adder levels is log base 2 of n, where n is the number of inputs. And the number of adders is n minus 1. So in this example where we have seven inputs, we have six adders. Now, if each of these adders is a fast adder, logarithmic time adder, then given that the first level adders are k bits wide, the second level adders are k plus 1 bits wide, then k plus 2 bits wide, the total latency will be given by this expression, log k plus log k plus 1 plus log k plus 2 up to the widest of the adders. And this uh, is readily simplified to this expression. Order log n log k plus log n log log n. So again, depending on whether log k dominates 
or log log n dominates, one of these two terms will be the overall complexity. Okay, so this is already better than uh, this design, which is order n log k or n log log n. So that n terms, n term here, has been replaced by log n. But of course, we are using much more hardware. But that's assuming the adders are fast adders. Now, if we use ripple carry adders, at first it seems that would be crazy because ripple carry adders are extremely slow. However, when you use ripple carry adders in this tree structure, something interesting happens. Uh, the latency becomes order k plus log n. Log n is basically the number of levels. Each level contributes just one unit of latency. And then k will be, because we are using ripple carry adder, that's the addition latency in the last level. So why is it that each level contributes only one unit? So potentially this expression gives you a lower latency than what we see up here. So this is log n. The one of the terms here down here is log n. Okay, it's log n. And here we have log n log k, so that term is larger. It's log n multiplied. And then we have k here, but k can potentially be larger than what we have up there. So it's not, uh, we can't tell for sure that this is faster, but it can be potentially faster. So for example, if k is a constant, let's say 32-bit number, we are adding 32-bit numbers. And n is very large, so you can ignore this constant 32 or k in general compared with log n when n is very large. Then the latency of the scheme is log n, whereas the scheme is slower, okay? So this can potentially be faster even though we are using much slower adders, ripple carry adders, and much cheaper adders. So the tree will be cheaper to build. So why is it that each level contributes just one unit of latency? This is shown on this diagram. Focus on that adder that I've circled. That's a ripple carry adder, meaning the carry propagates from the least significant bit to the most significant bit. The two adders that feed this adder are also ripple carry adder. However, this adder, the circled one, does not have to wait until carries are completely propagated in those two adders before it can start working. As soon as the first bit of addition is complete here and the first bit of addition is complete in the second adder, then the first bit of this adder can do its job. Then one unit time later, when carries have propagated to the second stage in these two adders, and we know the second bit sums, the second bit of this adder can be activated. So this adder essentially works in parallel with those adders with one unit of latency, one unit of time later than those, okay? So that's why each level of this adder tree introduces one unit of delay because carry propagation in it starts one unit after carry propagation in the previous stage. Okay, this becomes more clear as you look at the details of these ripple carry adders. You see that this top adder Let's say that top adder is the one shown here. And the bottom adder is this one. The top adder, let's say, receives its input at time t, at time t plus 1, where unit of time is the latency of one of these boxes. 
At unit t plus 1, this value becomes available. At unit t plus 1, the least significant bit of this adder is also available. So at unit t plus 2, this sum bit and this carry bit become known. And therefore, this adder just lags, lags that the other adder by one unit of time. It doesn't have to wait for full carry propagation in this adder before it can start its work. Now, the absolute best latency that we can hope for is order log k plus log n. So what we achieved in this method is order k plus log n which is pretty impressive already if k is small. But if k is not small, then the absolute best that we can hope for is order log k plus log n. And the reason for this is that when you process n k-bit inputs, you have a total of kn bits okay, to process. kn bits in total go through the circuit affecting the output. And therefore, log of k times n is the best latency we can hope for. And log of k times n is log k plus log n. And we'll see in a minute that we can actually achieve this best latency using uh, uh, other designs. OK, carry save adders we talked about in chapter 3, so in way of review. If you take a bunch of full adders, and instead of connecting carry of one to the next, chain them together to form a ripple carry adder, as shown at the top. If you view the carry as an input that comes from outside, so this carry in is actually an input. It doesn't come from another full adder. And the carry out is also an output. This, this set of full adder blocks, basically what they do, they take three input numbers. So these are the three least significant bits of the numbers. These are the next least significant bits. So it takes three numbers and generates two numbers. So it reduces three numbers to two numbers. That's the function of a carry save adder. So in dot notation, a regular adder basically takes two k-bit numbers and a carry in, and it produces the sum value and a carry out. A carry save adder takes three numbers, produces a sum value and a carry value. So these carries that you see here are shifted to the left by one bit. Okay, so this one will align with that sum bit. This carry will align with that sum bit and so on. So that's what you see here. So it reduces, a carry save adder reduces three numbers to two numbers such that the sum of those three numbers is the same as the sum of these two numbers. Okay, now in these kind, kinds of reductions, when we do carry save addition, uh, we use this notation, which is helpful in visualizing what is happening. So whenever we use a full adder to combine three bits, we use this dashed box to enclose the three bits, indicating that these three bits go into a full adder as inputs. And then the outputs of that full adder, the sum and the carry, are connected together by this line to visualize that these two bits come from the same full adder. So there's a full adder here, and these are the two output bits of that full adder. There's another full adder here, and these are its two output bits. Yet a third full adder here. Sometimes we have missing dots in this dot notation. So in this column, we have only two dots to be combined. And we can combine two dots with a half adder rather than a full adder. 
And uh, in this notation, we use, we still connect these two because this is the sum, this is the carry. We put this tick mark on that connection to indicate so that by looking at this diagram, we quickly realize that there's a half adder being utilized here. Another full adder, another full adder. So those three numbers uh, in this diagram, which are missing one of those dots, can be combined into two numbers by using one, two, three, four, five full adders and one half adder. So this diagram basically uh, tells us quickly what type of hardware we are using. We are using uh, five full adders and one half adder. Okay, so this is how we use carry save adders to combine seven numbers into two numbers. Okay, so we start by combining three numbers into two, and these three numbers into two, and this seventh number is not combined with anything. So we now have at this level just five numbers to add. So we reduce the seven numbers to five numbers. We again combine these three into two numbers. So we now have four numbers at this level. We combine these three numbers into two numbers. We have three numbers. And finally, this carry save adder leads to two numbers. So a carry save adder tree can reduce an arbitrary set of numbers at the top into two numbers if we provide an adequate number of levels. And the number of levels is turns out turns out is logarithmic in the number of inputs. It's not log base two, but it's logarithmic. And then those two numbers can be added using a regular ordinary adder to find a sum of the seven numbers. So we find the sum of the seven numbers in two stages. First, we use carry save adders to find the carry save representation of the sum, and then add these two numbers to find the binary conventional representation of the sum. So carry propagation occurs only once at the very end, this last carry propagate adder. None of these involves carry propagation. Those are basically constant time circuits, carry safe circuits. So the latency through the circuit will be one, two, three, four carry safe levels. So four units of carry safe addition. And then whatever latency this carry propagate adder has. Okay, so the tree height, as I mentioned, is logarithmic. And then the final adder also has logarithmic time, log k. Therefore, the latency is order log n plus log k, which is the best possible. And the complexity in terms of hardware is n minus 2 carry save adders. So in this case, with seven inputs, we have five carry save adders plus a carry propagate adder. Of course, we can do this technique of carry save addition with sequential addition as well. We don't have to do parallel addition using a lot of CSAs. We can use just one CSA and then there are two registers here that keep the sum and carry the two numbers that represents our carry save number. In each cycle, a new input is provided. It's added to the carry save number and the carry save result is developed and put in here. And we feed this back until all the numbers are exhausted. And then we use this carry propagate adder to add the contents of these two registers. 
So here again, we have like the very first design that I showed you. We need n cycles, n iterations through this carry save adder hardware, and just one pass through the carry propagate adder. So even though we still require n cycles, the cycles are not much shorter because the cycles correspond to carry save addition rather than an ordinary addition. So this is sort of a low cost way of implementing a pretty good multi-operand adder because even though we need n cycles, each of those cycles will be very short. And then we need one cycle at the very end for the carry propagate adder, which is much longer. Okay, so this is an example in dot notation of what happens when we use a carry save adder tree. See here, I'm adding uh, seven six bit numbers. So there are seven numbers, each six bits wide. So I combine these three bits using a full adder, and these are the sum and carry. I combine these three bits, and these are the sum and the carry. And the seventh bit is not combined with anything, so I just transfer it down. So I reduce the number of dots in that column from seven to three. In this column, I do the same thing. Reduce those seven to three, but I also have the two carries coming from these two adders. So I have five dots. Okay, so after I apply all these full adders, I have basically five numbers to add. I started with seven numbers, I now have five numbers. I apply the same method again. So I use the full adder to combine these three bits. This is the sum, this is the carry. A full adder to combine these three bits the sum and the carry. Okay, and then these two bits at the very bottom are just transferred because I, do, I combine dots when there are three of them. So when there are two, I don't combine them, I just transfer them down. Now I have four numbers to add at this stage. I use 12 full adders in the first stage. These are the 12 full adders. And I use six full adders in this stage. One, two, three, four, five, six. As I mentioned, the hardware that is being used is evident from the way I draw these diagrams. Then another six full adders here. And I now have three numbers. Notice that this bit is a single bit. And I will never get any other bits in that column. So that bit is already in its final form and it's just transferred down in the subsequent stages. So now I have three numbers. I use a bunch of full adders, one, two, three, four, and a half adder in this stage. This is the half adder to convert the result into two numbers. And then I use a regular adder that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bits wide to complete the process. This bit is already in its final form. The other seven bits are combined in a seven bit adder to give you the seven bit sum and the carry out. So this is now the 9-bit sum of the 7 6-bit numbers. Because I have 7 numbers, 3 bits, log base 2 of 7 will be added to the width of the numbers. So this is 3 bits wider. Okay, an alternate way of showing this uh, process, reduction process, which is easier is to use a table. So rather than just draw dots, the only thing that is really important is how many dots I have here. So I can just write the number of dots. I have seven dots, seven, 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 
in six columns when I begin. Then when I have seven dots, two groups of three will be combined and one will be left over. So the two groups of three will give me two sum bits and then that leftover dot is added to give me three bits total. So I can do the calculation mentally without drawing all those dots. So I have three dots here. Here I have three dots from those seven bits plus two dots from the carries from this column and so on. So this is a compact representation of this diagram in which we focus on the number of dots that are left in each column. Eventually we have one dot in each column at the end, which is that final result. But just before that, we have one, two, one, two, and so on. So that's the representation there. So this is an alternate representation of that carry save reduction process. Now a full adder compacts three dots into two. When I use a full adder, I process three bits, three input bits, and generate two output bits. So it reduces the total number of dots by a factor of 1.5. A half adder doesn't do, doesn't do any reduction. It just takes two dots, like here, and generates two dots. It just rearranges the two dots. Instead of both of them being in the same column, one is in this column, one is in the next column. So no compression takes place there. Okay, so this is a little bit, uh, in a bit more detail, the same process that we talked about. Here I'm adding seven k-bit numbers that I've shown at the top. And I'm also indicating the bit positions for those numbers. So each of those numbers has bits in position 0 through k minus 1. It's a k-bit number, okay, k-bit binary number. When I add three such numbers in a carry-save adder, the sum result will go from position 0 to k minus 1, like the input. The carry result goes from position 1 to k. Okay, so this notation now allows me to keep track of where I have dots in these numbers. So let me go back here. As you see, when I add three numbers that go from position 0 to k minus 1, the sum value will go from position 0 to k minus 1, like the input, and the carry vector, carry value, will go from position 1 to k. It's shifted to the left by one bit. Oop. OK, now back to this diagram. Now, at the next level, I take this sum value that goes from position 0 to k minus 1, this sum value, and this original input bit. So all three inputs go from position 0 to k minus 1. So again, the sum will be from 0 to k minus 1, and the carry from 1 to k. Now I take this carry that goes from position 1 to k and combine it with this carry and this carry, they all have bits in the exact same positions. So the sum will go from position 1 to k, and the carry from position 2 to k plus 1. And I continue in this way. This particular number has bit position 0, whereas nothing else has bit position 0. So that bit 0 basically is forwarded to the output, 
I don't need to do anything with it because there's just one bit in that position. But the leftover from this number after I discard that position zero bit will be one through k minus one. So here now I have three numbers that are different. One goes from position one to k minus one. One goes from position one to k. One goes from position two to k plus one. So let's see how to deal with this. So that particular carry save adder has inputs that are slightly different. One goes from position one to k minus one, the second one from position one to k, the third one from position two to k minus one. So the carry save adder will have a half adder in this position. That's the half adder. It will have full adders up to position k minus 1, each of them producing a sum and a carry. It will have a half adder in position k, producing sum and carry, and nothing in position k plus 1 that's just transferred down. And now the output of this k bit carry save adder goes from position 1 to k plus 1 for sum and 2 to k plus 1 for carry. Again, the bit in position 1 is a single bit. I just discard it, forward it to the output. The leftover from that number now goes from position 2 to k plus 1. So I use a carry propagate adder. Notice what happened here. As I go down in these uh, uh, adder trees, I expect my numbers to become wider, right? Because whenever you add k bit numbers, you get k plus 1 bit numbers. So numbers should get wider and wider. But as you notice that in this tree, all the carry save adders are k bits wide. And even the carry propagate adder at the end is k bits wide. What happened? What caused this uh, basically phenomenon that the adder widths do not seem to grow? The reason is that we get rid of some bits in the intermediate stages. So we got rid of one bit here so that that bit is not processed in uh, the subsequent levels. We got rid of one bit here so on. So these bits that drop out basically shrink the width of the adders that are required. Of course, there's no guarantee that the adders will always be k bits wide, but the width either does not grow or grow just a little bit rather than, you know, the amount that we expect because of the wider operands. Okay, so we are interested in building trees that take n inputs and produce two outputs. And such a tree will have h levels, where the number h of levels is a function of n. Okay, so h is a function of n, and the function h of n can be defined by the following recurrence. h of n is 1 plus h of 2n over 3, the stealing of that. OK, the reason is that if you consider how many numbers we have at this level, so at the top level, we have n numbers, n numbers. How many numbers do we have here? Well, we combine three inputs to give us two inputs. So if the number of inputs is divisible by three, we get two thirds of n here. If it's not divisible by three, we get the ceiling of two n over three here. Okay, so if we start, let's say, with nine numbers at the top, 
9 is a multiple of 3, we will get 6 values here, 2n over 3. If we start with uh, 7 values, 7 is not a multiple of 3. We get the ceiling of 7 divided by 3, which is 3. Okay? Uh, sorry, uh, ceiling of 2 times 7, 14 divided by 3, which is 5. And this is basically what we got here in this diagram. You see, we started with 7, and we got 5 numbers after the first level. Two-thirds of these, but the ceiling of that value if it's not divisible by 3. Okay, so this recurrence basically says that I can reduce the n values to ceiling of 2 n over 3 values, and then I need h of that many inputs. The number of levels from this point on is h of 2n over 3. Okay, another way to characterize this relationship between the number of inputs and the number of levels is to take n to be a function of h. So n is the maximum number of inputs that I can process with h levels. Okay. This is the number of inputs that I can process with h minus 1 levels. And 1 and a half times that, 3 over 2 of that, is the number of inputs that I can have up there, the maximum number. OK, so there are two recurrences. One uses h as a function of n. And uh, this is the recurrence for that function. The other one uses n, the maximum number of inputs for a given number of levels, which is characterized by this recurrence. So if you remove the ceilings and floors for simplicity, basically each level reduces the number of inputs by a factor one and a half. So we go from nine to six, a factor of one and a half reduction, from six to four, a factor of one and a half reduction. Whenever the number of inputs is not a multiple of three, the reduction will be a bit smaller. But roughly speaking, as an approximation, you can say that this will be log of n in base one and a half, the number of levels, approximately. Okay, so we can build a table to find the exact value of n of h as a function of h. Because of this floor, we don't have a closed form expression, but we can enumerate all cases. So for example, if I have two inputs, then I need zero levels to reduce them to two, two values. Three inputs need one level. Four inputs need two levels. Six inputs need three levels and so on. So that's the maximum number of inputs, six, that you can handle with three levels. The maximum number of inputs with four levels is nine. So what about the values in between? What about if I have seven inputs? Well, seven inputs, we go to the next higher number here. So for seven inputs, we'll need four levels. For eight inputs, we need four levels. Because seven and eight are too many for three levels. Therefore, those intermediate numbers go to the next value of h. OK, so for example, if I'm doing a 64-bit multiplication and I have 64 partial products to add, I look for the number 64 here. I have 63 that requires nine levels, but that's not quite enough to add 64 numbers. Therefore, I will need 10 levels, 10 carry save levels, in order to reduce 64 inputs to two values. OK, in this slide, you see two methods for reducing 
the dots that represent the multiple values that we are trying to add. One method is known as Wallace, Wallace's method. It leads to a Wallace tree. The other one, uh, invented by Dada or proposed by Dada, leads to a Dada tree. The difference between these two is the following. Wallace basically combines things as early as possible. So as soon as you have three dots here, you combine them. You have three more dots here, you combine them. And then you get five numbers here. Then you have three dots. Here. So as early as possible, you combine the dots in order to reduce them as quickly as possible and get to this output as quickly as possible. Now Dada makes the following observation. He says, okay, with seven inputs, according to the table in the previous slide, with seven inputs, I need four levels, okay? With seven inputs, I need four levels. With six inputs, I need three levels, okay? So what I do at the outset is just aim for reducing the seven numbers to six numbers because I know seven numbers need four levels, six numbers need three levels. So if I reduce the seven numbers to six numbers, I'm on track to do things as fast as possible. In other words, this strategy of delaying reductions does not lead to added latency. So in Dada's method, we just apply one row of full adders at the top because once I apply that one row of full adders, okay, so that full adder gives me the sum carry, sum carry. I've got six numbers there. So I don't need further reduction to get to a number of inputs, number of values that require three levels to reduce. Now from six, the next number in that table is four. So I aim to go from six to four using the minimum possible amount of hardware to do that. So for example, here I notice that I have five dots in the rightmost column. Okay, I have five dots in the rightmost column. Actually, I could have used the half adder here because if I had used the half adder, so these two dots would be converted to sum and carry, and the other three dots would go there, I still would have four, okay? And as long as I have four dots here, the speed will be the maximum possible. So I could have used a half adder here instead of this full adder. I used a full adder. So I now have only three dots in the rightmost column. Okay, similarly, I could have replaced one of these two full adders in the second column by a half adder because I can afford to have an extra dot there. All right, so from six, I go to four. From four, I go to three. From three to two, and these numbers, you know, seven, six, four, three, two, come from this table. Seven is basically what we started for. Then we go to six, then to four, then to three, then to two. So Dada's strategy delays the reductions as much as possible without hurting the speed. Now what happens because Wallace, Wallace's method does the reduction early, these, some of these dots basically can be retired early and usually the width of the final adder ends up being shorter. Whereas Dada, because sort of procrastinates and delays things, sometimes it leads to a wider adder at the end. Okay, so there are two, these are two different strategies for building a carry save adder tree. One does the reduction as early as possible, 
to achieve maximum speed. The other one does the reduction as late as possible while still achieving maximum speed. Okay, this optimization I'm going to skip. You can read it on your own if you are interested. So this leads us to a discussion of circuits that we call parallel counters. Uh, parallel counters are basically circuits that count the number of ones among a set of inputs. So if you look at the full adder, it's really a parallel counter because it counts how many ones we have among these three inputs and represents that count as a binary number. So if we have three ones here, this will be one one, which is the number three. If you have two ones, this will read one zero. So we call this a three two counter, meaning it has three inputs, it has two outputs. And the output is the count of the number of inputs that are equal to one. So if you use a bunch of these three two parallel counters to reduce consecutive columns of uh, three numbers, we reduce them to two numbers. This is a seven three counter. It has seven inputs. It counts the number of ones among the seven inputs and presents the count as a three bit number. Okay, more generally, the number of inputs being n, the sum will be log two, log base two of n plus one. So the counter will be n semicolon log two n plus one counter. This is another example. It's a 10-4 counter. It has 10 inputs, and it produces a 4-bit number, which is the count of the number of ones among the inputs. And this is implemented by a bunch of full adders as shown in this dot notation. So we use three full adders at the beginning. These are the sum and carry, and this is the leftover bit. Then we use two full adders in this stage, some carry, some carry, and leftover dot, and then a three bit adder to get the four bit output. So basically larger parallel counters can be synthesized from smaller, from three two counters. Okay, so this is something that I formulated just recently. In fact, the paper uh, explaining it is not yet published. So if you want to design what I call a parallel counting network with n inputs, here is a recursive strategy. You supply n over two inputs into this parallel counting network of half the size, n over two inputs here. And if n is even, there are no leftovers. n over two inputs go there, n over two there. But if n is odd, one input will be left over, and that input will be provided as carry in to this adder. So this is the count of the number of ones among these inputs. This is the count of the number of ones among these inputs. This is the leftover bit, if any. And then these are added to get the count among all n inputs. So if you unroll this recursive scheme for 10 inputs, this is what you get. So you basically have uh, five inputs at the top and five inputs at the bottom and nothing here. So that's nothing that is not used. This is the adder, five inputs. And then with five inputs, you have two inputs here, two inputs here, and this is the leftover bit. Similarly for here. 
and then with two inputs you can use a half adder as your parallel counting network so number of ones among two inputs are counted by a half adder which gives you a two bit number so this is a two bit number two bit number this is a three bit number this is a three bit number and this is a four bit number okay this is another example with 15 inputs so with 15 inputs you have seven and seven plus one left over for seven you have three and three plus one left over and then for three you use a full adder basically to count the number of ones among those three okay so this shows the recursive construction of uh, parallel counters from smaller parallel counters okay I have also defined some years ago the notion of a cumulative parallel counter because when we think of an ordinary sequential counter an ordinary sequential counter has a count register that maintains the count the ongoing uh, accumulated count and then when a new count command uh, comes in count signal comes in you add one to that and so on so if the clock pulse is asserted the clock is asserted and the count signal is one then we increment the counter so we can define an accumulative parallel counter in a similar way so we have a count register that maintains an accumulative count and then a parallel incrementer that takes that count existing count and adds to it the total number of ones among the parallel increment signals and then gives you the new count which is then stored in that register so what we called parallel counters previously is really only this parallel incrementer part with this input being zero so it basically just counts the number of ones among these and presents it here so this is a more appropriate generalization of a sequential counter because we also have a stored count that is added to these parallel increment signals and then the new count is stored back in the register okay I'm going to skip this diagram it shows how you can implement an accumulative parallel counter all right we can also have up down parallel counter just as we have up down ordinary sequential counters and I'm going to skip this as well basically two counters one dealing with negative values one dealing with positive values okay we also have the concept of generalized parallel counters uh, a parallel counter receives its inputs all in one column all of the same weight and produces some outputs a generalized parallel counter can receive inputs in multiple columns so basically what the circuit does it receives five two-bit numbers as inputs and produces their sum as a four bit number now a two bit number can be a maximum of three so five of them can be a maximum of 15 the sum of five therefore a four bit can be represented in four bits so this counter you can invent this notation for it it receives five input bits in one column five input bits in another column and it produces a four bit output so we call this a five five four counter or generalized counter so what's good about this five five four counter is that if you put a bunch of them next to each other you can reduce five numbers into two numbers so the four bit outputs of each of these counters is shown in this weird way so for example the rightmost 
five five four counter gets these bits and produces this four bit result. The next one produces this four bit result and so on. So it reduces five numbers to two numbers. Okay, of course, uh, the fully generalized parallel counters don't even have to have the same number of dots in multiple columns. So this one shows a counter that receives two dots in one column, three dots in the next column. So it basically adds uh, a two bit number, another two bit number, and a one bit number. So maximum three, maximum three, maximum one, so that's seven, so three bits would be adequate to represent the sum of those. Sometimes generalized parallel counters are called parallel compressors because the com they compress the number of bits. Even parallel counters do, do the same thing. So for example, here we began with 10 dots as inputs and we produce four dots as outputs. So we compressed the number of dots from 10 to four. Of course, these have higher weights. That's why the four bits can still represent the same values as the original 10 bits. Okay, so one of the ways of designing multipliers is known as parallel compression. So here I've shown, suppose I want to add these decimal numbers. Okay, I can do the normal addition. In other words, add the rightmost column. Okay, the rightmost column has the values uh, eight, seven, four. So eight plus seven is 15 plus 4, 19, 23, 28, 34, 35. So I can write 5 here and carry 3 into the next column. Alternatively, I can do some parallel processing and add the columns separately. So when I add the rightmost column and I get 35, instead of carrying something to the next column, I write the 35 like this. I add the next column and I get 31. I add the next column, I get 23. The next column gives me 39. The one after that gives me 40. And the final column gives me 48. So basically what I did, I compressed each column into a two digit decimal number. And then at the end, if I add these two decimal numbers, shown at the bottom, I find the sum of all those, all those initial numbers. So basically what I've done, I've done the process in two stages. First I do column compression, and then I add the two resulting numbers. Now if I want to have two resulting numbers, uh, what is the maximum column length that I can accommodate? Think about this question a little bit before advancing the video. How many numbers, how many decimal numbers can I add in this way if I want each column to be compressed into just two digits? All right, so I'm gonna give you the answer now. The answer is that the, the two digit number is a maximum of 99. And given that each digit can have a maximum value of 9, it can accommodate 11 such numbers. So when I add 11 numbers, even if all the digits happen to be 9 in a particular column, 11 times 9 is 99, and I can still represent it with two digits. If I go beyond 11 numbers, then it's possible that the compressed value will be a three-digit value. So I'll be reducing uh, those numbers to three numbers, not two numbers.
Okay, so I'm interested in uh, multi-operand addition to in reducing n inputs eventually to two inputs, <coughs> going through multiple stages. Now, one way to do this is to use the so-called n2 counters. In other words, I want to design circuits that directly go from n inputs to two outputs, rather than go from n to something smaller and then multiple stages before going to two. I want to directly reduce n numbers to two numbers. Of course, when I have n inputs into one particular bit slice in a particular bit position, those n inputs are not representable by just the sum and the carry bit into two numbers because the sum and the carry bit can represent a maximum of three units, one unit here and two units here. But the n can be much larger than three. So the solution is to allow values to be transferred from a column to higher columns. So here I've assumed the general scheme in which column i-1 transfer psi sub 1 bits to that column. Column i-2 transfers psi sub 2 bits to that column. Psi sub 3 and so on. So there are transfers, transfer of values from the column to the higher columns. So similarly, this column itself, the column i, transfers psi1 values to i plus 1, psi2 values to i plus 2, psi3 values to i plus 3. There can be more, more than three transfers. And now I can manage this design makes sense if n, which is the number of inputs coming into this slice, plus all the transfers coming into this slice, psi1 from this position, psi2, psi3, and so on. So this is the total value coming into the slice. n inputs plus transfers, psi1 plus psi2 plus psi3. Psi then these values should be able to I should be able to represent them using three here, because I can have at most three there, plus two times psi one, plus four times psi two, plus eight times psi three. Because these psi one bits that go to the next higher column, they're worth doubles. So that's why I multiply by two. Psi two, because it goes two columns up, is multiplied by four. Psi 3 is multiplied by 8. So I can simplify that expression by removing uh, 1 Psi 1 from the right side, 1 Psi 2, and so on, this. So this scheme is workable as long as n minus 3 is less than or equal to Psi 1 plus 3 Psi 2 plus 7 Psi 3, and so on. So for example, suppose I want to design an 11-2 counter n is equal to 11. Okay, if n is equal to 11, n minus 3 is 8. So I have to choose these transfers such that the sum is equal to 8. Okay, let's say I choose psi 3 to be 0. I don't want three stages to be transferred. The more transfers I have, the more the wiring complexity, because these wires will be longer. So let's say I aim to have only psi 1 and psi 2. So psi 1 plus 3 psi 2 must be greater than or equal to 8. Possible choices equal uh, are psi 1 equal to 5, psi 2 equal to 1, 5, 1 or psi1 equals psi2 equal to 2. So those lead to two different designs. 
with different transfer schemes. One has five bits going to the next higher position and only one bit going to two higher positions. This one has two bits going to the next higher positions and two bits going two stages up. Okay, this one I'm gonna let you study. So four two counters are special cases of this where n is equal to four. They're very useful as we will see. So we'll revisit this uh, four two counter in our discussion of multipliers, okay? So we'll wait for that. Adding multiple sign numbers I'm gonna skip because we, we will revisit this when we talk about multiplication. The final topic uh, here is a modulo multi-operand addition. So if you want to do modulo to the k, as we had the last time, you just drop this carry out because that's worth two to the k, and this will be the correct modular representation of the sum. If you want to do modulo to the k minus one, the carry that goes out from here, you reinsert into this empty slot. So that will give you modulo to the k minus one sum of your numbers. And modulo to the k plus one, this one is not as immediately obvious. You take the carry out, invert it, and reinsert it in the in position zero. So these particular values to the k, to the k minus one, to the k plus one, allow for simple modular multi-operand addition. Okay, if you have a general modular reduction, for example, modulo 21, one solution is, so suppose you want to do modulo 21 addition of these six five-bit numbers. Okay, modulo 21 residues are five-bit numbers, okay? So I have five five-bit numbers, I want to add them and compute the result modulo 21. Okay, modulo 21 does not lend itself to simple modular computation. So one approach would be to just add these as normal and allow the width to expand. So what we have here are not real residues, but they're pseudo residues because the magnitude can exceed. Uh, the largest residue modulo 21 should be 20, okay? whereas numbers that I encounter here can be larger than 20. Suppose I allow these to grow to six bits. When they grow to six bits, and then the seventh bit, is now 64, is worth 64 units. But 64 is one modulo 21, so I basically can take that 64, which is one modulo 21, and insert it as one here. So sometimes working with pseudo residues allow me to basically ignore the modular reduction in the intermediate steps and do this simple modular reduction. Of course, this is still a pseudo residue and if I want to get a real residue, I, have, I still have some work done, work needed to be done on this. But at least in the intermediate steps, I didn't have to do any modular reduction. Okay, so this concludes uh, lecture six for the course. Um, next time we will start part uh, three uh, of the uh, textbook which deals with multiplication. It has four chapters and we'll have four lectures devoted to those four chapters. Okay, so see you at the next lecture. Bye.